We're going to see four different demonstrations. The first two of them are going to be in chauffeur mode. What chauffeur means is that the car drives for you. You would use a chauffeur car if you can't drive, for instance, if you're disabled, if you don't want to drive, if the traffic is very bad, or if you're taking a taxi cab ride, like mobility as a service. The other two demonstrations are going to be in guardian mode. This is for people who want to drive. It's a safety net against having a crash. We have designed a special test car, which has dual steering wheels, dual brakes, and dual accelerators. The reason for this is that we need two different personnel in the front of the car. One is a safety driver. The other driver is a test driver. They are there to interact with the car as if they're the actual driver in a production car. But for our development, this is a tremendous advance because it lets us test the Guardian system with a actual test driver while still having a safety driver there just in case. We're going to start off with the chauffeur mode of the car, uh, where the car is going to be doing all the driving for us. So you can basically sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. All right, you ready, Sharon? Yes, I'm ready. Are you ready, Aaron? I'm ready. OK, here we go. And one of the real world things that we have to handle in self-driving mode are all the randomness that occurs every day. And actually, in this lap, uh, we're recreating a scenario where we've had a pickup truck drive along the track and actually dump some hay bales out of the back randomly. So what you're going to see is our car senses, does a safe lane change, senses the next one, and also then changes back. Very simple. So what we're going to show you in this lab now is how this car is able to interact with all the traffic uh, on the roadway. So as we're coming around the bend here, you'll see that there's a, another car on the track with us. The car senses it. <laughs> oh, uh, it's right there. See, we got actually our pickup truck parked in our lane blocking us. Oh, no. So you see our vehicle slow down, nice. tuck in behind that vehicle that was in our blind spot, and then do a smooth lane change back. That was really smooth. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, very cool. Now we're going to demonstrate our Guardian system. We're going to emulate what happens when a driver falls asleep. Guardian can tell by using a camera that's part of the dashboard. The camera can even see through sunglasses in order to see what the driver's eyes are doing or if their head is moving into a position that indicates they're not paying attention. So Ryan, whenever you're ready, why don't you go ahead and pretend to fall asleep? And now Guardian has stepped in. It's driving the car for you. And now it will offer at some point to give it back to you. Why don't you go ahead and take it now? One of the most frightening things that can happen on the highway is when a car in front of you switches lanes to avoid debris. You have very little time to react because your view is blocked by the car in front of you. We have sensors that can see significantly better than a human driver can see. The Guardian is going to take over where a car switches lanes in front of us in order to avoid debris. Here, that car switches lanes. Guardian decides we have to switch lanes also, and we avoid having a crash. Now Guardian has offered to hand back control, and Ryan has taken control back of the car. So today you've seen demonstrations of two basic technologies that the Toyota Research Institute is doing research on. This is all part of PRI's work to eventually build a car that can never be responsible for a crash, regardless of what the driver does. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Gil Pratt, CEO of Toyota Research Institute. Right. So I hope that you enjoyed that movie and that the movie gave you a nice taste and an understanding of chauffeur versus guardian. I want to talk a little bit about the motivation for automated driving, sort of step back and take a really high level view. The first motivation, of course, is safety. We want to prevent crashes. This is Toyota's most important goal for automated driving. And I've given a little scale here of 10 out of 10. And thinking about, is chauffeur any good for preventing crashes? Is Guardian any good for preventing crashes? And the answer is, both of them are extremely good. In the case of chauffeur, the car does the driving for you. In the case of Guardian, the system is a safety net and prevents you from having a crash. In either case, it prevents crashes. What's another motivation for automated driving? Traffic. 
we want to prevent traffic jams. When a highway is overloaded and the density of the cars is too high, speeds go way down, the flow rate inside of the highway goes way down, becomes very inefficient. Well, chauffeur, of course, is very good at doing that. You could imagine vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure communication, giving feedback to the car, telling it to slow down and prevent traffic jams from happening. But this can happen in Guardian as well by giving a driver information, telling them when it's time to accelerate or to slow down or even putting boundaries on how fast they can go or how slow they can go. So it works just as well in both systems. Another motivation access. And by this, I mean you know, that heartbreaking thing that happened to me personally of telling your parents as they grow older, I'm sorry, Dad, I have to take away your car keys. And for all those of us here that are car enthusiasts, that's a terrible, terrible thing for a son to have to do to a parent. Uh, but I had to do it. And so we call this mobility for all. It's one of Toyota's greatest goals. We want everybody to be able to enjoy the benefit of mobility. Well, Chauffeur obviously solves that problem 10 out of 10. How about Guardian? Guardian solves it most of the way, because if you don't have to worry that mom or dad are going to have a crash as a result of driving, even if their reflexes aren't so good, the Guardian can help you achieve that and extend the amount of time that they can continue to drive safely. It also, by the way, works for teenagers. I don't know if you know this, but for teenagers, 35% of fatalities are caused by automobile crashes. That's a terrible number. How about driving that number as close to zero as we can get? Guardian can help us to do that. Convenience, allow multitasking. What do people really want to do during their commute every day when they're in their car stuck in traffic? In most cases, they don't want to be driving. They would much rather be looking at their cell phone. In fact, some of the time they do, which causes some of the crashes. So Chauffeur does an excellent job, of course, of allowing for multitasking. You can use that time in the car to do something else. But Guardian is actually pretty good at that as well. You can't completely disengage from driving the car, but you can somewhat disengage because the Guardian will stop you from having a crash. So we give that a 5 out of 10. Another reason, the environment. Great promise of automated driving is to get rid of the need for parking lots and parking garages. The cars can basically go park themselves. Or in the case of mobility as a service, they never have to park in the first place. Chauffeur is very good at that. Guardian really isn't useful for a car that doesn't have a driver within it. Final one, productivity. Driverless mobility as a service. This is the idea which isn't talked about very much, but it's clear in the last talk you saw from Waymo, if you can remove the driver from mobility as a service, you can make that system much more economical. And so, of course, chauffeur is necessary for that system. We're working on that as well. Guardian, really not very useful for that as well. That gets a zero. So having gone through these six motivations for automated driving, Let's now talk about some of the issues, some of the problems that we have with automated driving and see how it compares between chauffeur and Guardian. Because right now, if you look at that, chauffeur looks great. Guardian's kind of OK. Responsibility. Who's liable from a legal point of view, from a moral point of view, when something goes wrong? In the case of chauffeur, it's undoubtedly the autonomy. There is not a human being that is in control of the car, so of course, it's the autonomy system and whoever makes it that is liable. And this is a serious concern. In the case of the Guardian, it's still the human being. You can think about automatic emergency braking as a primitive form of Guardian that interferes if you're about to have a frontal crash. And still, the human being is liable in that case. So that's a sort of a green area for Guardian because we don't have to change how the law works right now. <clears throat> and we don't have to solve this difficult question. How about how good does the system have to be, the performance that's required? What's the mandatory competence that you need from a technical point of view for each one of these systems? In the case of chauffeur, the system better not crash ever. Because if it does, public trust in automated driving in chauffeur mode is going to go way, way down. And so crashes are actually quite catastrophic from many points of view, particularly a business point of view. We feel, in fact, that human beings are likely to trust a machine much less than a person simply because it's harder to empathize with the machine. And so the machine has to be significantly safer than a human driver would be. In the case of Guardian, it's actually not quite that bad. 
Uh, a guardian system, like automatic emergency braking, does not guarantee that you will not have an accident. It tries as hard as it can to prevent the accident, but what it actually guarantees is that it won't make things worse. And so again, from a technical point of view, the minimum competency, the mandatory competence, is significantly lower for guardian than it is for chauffeur. Of course, we desire much higher competence in both of these systems. The ideal competence that we would have in either chauffeur or guardian. In the chauffeur system, the idea, just like you saw in the Waymo videos, is that it never needs a human driver at all. Uh, in the case of Guardian, it's to prevent a human driver from ever having a crash. Now, the reason the Guardian one is in orange and the chauffeur one is in red is that in the case of Guardian, we're actually adding together the competence of a human driver to the competence of an AI system that's being the Guardian on top. So we're actually adding together their competence, filling in places where each one is weak with the competence of the other one. In the case of chauffeur, we're entirely relying on one system, not merging together the competence of two. And so as a result, technically, the Guardian is actually somewhat easier to do than the chauffeur for the maximum performance that we desire. How about technical difficulty? How hard is it to actually do this? And the answer is that it depends. And in the same way that it was discussed in the last talk, there's been a lot of misunderstanding in this field. How difficult it is to do L2 is significantly easier than doing L3, easier than L4, easier than L5. And so the range of technical difficulty, depending on the environment and the level of autonomy, goes from very easy to very difficult. But the chauffeur systems, if you're going to do L2 and L3, have serious handoff and supervision issues in user interface that are very difficult to address. And so at the easier levels of technical accomplishment, the difficulty of user interface is actually quite high. In the case of Guardian, again, we can go from systems like AEB, which are quite primitive, to systems where the car never lets you have a crash no matter what you do, which is quite difficult. But for all of those systems, there's no handoff issue, there's no supervision issue. The user interface is actually quite simple and quite safe. And so Guardian, again, is easier to implement than chauffeur in these cases. You're beginning to see here, by the way, if you look at it, that what we lacked a little bit of green on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, we're beginning to make up here when we look at these technical difficulties in actually implementing these systems. And then finally, let's talk about the regulatory situation, the legal situation. Do you need new regulations in order to put these vehicles on the road? Currently, it varies by state. But in general, both the federal government and the states individually are wrestling with these questions of when it is OK to allow a car to operate without a driver behind the wheel. And so in many cases, we in fact do need changes in regulation. For Guardian, that's not true. Guardian can be implemented right now on any car because, again, the human has the responsibility for driving the car. And the system, as long as it does no harm, is just there to try to save the person when they make a mistake. So looking at this chart in total, what you'll see here is that the situation is quite balanced, actually, between the two of them. And it's the reason that at the Toyota Research Institute, we're working on both systems, both guardian and chauffeur. And we see advantages to each one of them. Now, let's use that information we just learned to talk about some myths and expose them and see what the realities are behind the myths. Myth number one is that chauffeur, and you could call it autonomous driving or driverless cars, is needed in order to save lives. Now, why is that a myth? It's not that autonomous driving won't save lives. It's the word needed. And unfortunately, people confuse this a lot. The reality is that the chauffeur systems, autonomous driving, driverless cars, is one way of saving lives, but it's not the only way to save lives. The Guardian system, of which automatic emergency braking is, again, a primitive example, can save lives. And it actually has fewer difficulties in implementation than the chauffeur one. And so it can be deployed sooner. And we can begin to save lives sooner than in the chauffeur systems. Myth number two, we need new regulations as soon as possible to allow autonomous cars on the road in order to save lives as soon as possible. Well, Toyota is very much in favor of appropriate changes to regulations in order to allow autonomous cars on the road when it is safe to do so. 
We do believe that the federal government has a great role to play in getting rid of the patchwork of laws that currently lots of states have, so we generally support what other OEMs and other technology companies are doing in the regulatory space here. But we want the reason to be correct. The reason for getting these laws passed now, there's many of them, I went through them before, but it's not only to save lives. In fact, Guardian can save lives sooner without any need for new regulations. So let's go ahead and get those laws changed, but let's not fool ourselves into thinking that it's necessary to do so in order to save lives. Another myth. Billions of dollars are being spent on autonomous driving only for critically important reasons like safety, access, traffic, convenience, and the environment. These are all wonderful reasons to work on automated driving and for us to change laws in order for automated driving uh, to become more commonplace. But it's not the reason that the money is being spent. The reality is that increasing productivity for mobility as a service is the major motivation for why so much money is being spent in this field and why there are so many of you that are sitting in the chairs right now. Those top things are wonderful. We care about them as a company very deeply, but it's not the reason so much money is being spent. Uh, Deutsche Bank did an analysis that says the average revenue for a Maz ride in the United States is around $1.50 per mile. That's what the customer pays on average for a ride with uh, Uber or Lyft or one of those companies. Uh, average cost of the vehicle to the driver, including gasoline, maintenance, depreciation, all of those things, average around 85 cents per mile. And so what that means is that the 65 cents of difference between $1.50 and 85 cents is available. Available to whom? Well, available to the driver and available to the company that's providing the ride-sharing service and maybe available to the company that made the car in the first place. It's hard to tell, but that's actually quite a bit of money. And if we remove the driver from that equation, more of that money becomes available for somebody to make as profit. And that's the reason so much money is being spent in this field. Now, of course, this is a static analysis. The reality is that adding autonomy into a car means a lot of equipment, so the cost of the vehicle goes up from the numbers that you see here, which is for a non-automated vehicle. And of course, as competition occurs, as the, uh, the costs go down, the revenue may go down as well. So it's important to understand that this is a very optimistic assumption about how much money there is to be made per mile in the automated mobility as a service business. But that's why so much money is being spent. Now, presently, and this was actually John Krafcek who did this um, analysis recently, most OEMs, most car manufacturers, make around one penny per mile of profit on cars. If you take a car that lasts 150,000 miles, you divide the profit of a car company by the volume of the cars that it makes, you come to something on the order of one penny per mile. One penny is not much compared to 65 pennies per mile. And so part of the reason you see the OEMs so excited about the mobility as a service field is because of this difference. So I just want to hopefully educate all of you as to some of the realities that are going on in this field. Now, I go ahead and I take a little green highlighter here and I put a green marker on productivity because uh, that's where the money is. This is where the heart is. Our heart, of course, goes to issues of safety, first of all. Our heart goes to issues of traffic and the frustrations of traffic. Our heart goes to issues of access for aging society about how difficult it is when you are too old to drive. But let's remember that the money is there in productivity as well. And it's, in fact, the combination of these two things that we at the Toyota Research Institute understand are the real drivers going on in this field. So now let me deep, go a little bit deeper into technology, because this is a really sort of heavy technological talk here, in case you haven't noticed. Uh, very similar technologies between Guardian and Chauffeur. I think it's very exciting. If you watch the video, you notice that when it was in Guardian mode and it said, you're doing something bad, I'm going to drive for you, during that time it was driving, it's indistinguishable from Chauffeur, right? It switches modes and says, now it's my turn. I'm going to take over for you. And then it offers to give the car back to you and says, whenever you want, tap the brake pedal, just like getting out of cruise control, 
and the car is yours once more. Again, flipping back from chauffeur mode to manual driving mode. So the technology that's involved is very similar in both of these. Perception, localization, prediction of what other cars and pedestrians are going to do, planning, and control when the system is engaged to begin with. Guardian also needs some extra technology, which we're working on. One, how much risk does the human have as they're driving? The answer depends very much on the environment and depends very much on the history of what you learn about how the person drives. It also needs a user interface for warning the driver at first and then subsuming the control from the driver when it's necessary. Finally, some people say, well, doesn't Guardian have a harder time because the human driver may put the car into a very bad state, and that's just when the Guardian tries to take over? The answer is yes, of course that's true, but it's also true that a chauffeur car has to contend with other drivers, possibly driven by human, human beings, misbehaving and creating a near miss. So both systems actually have to deal with very difficult situations. Let me introduce a new idea here for the first time. The new idea is that Guardian can not only guard human beings, it can also guard chauffeur. It doesn't matter who's driving the car, whether it's a human being or an AI system. We know, as I said before, that it's hard for people to forgive a machine when it makes a mistake. The public might expect that a chauffeur autonomy system actually has to be much safer than human driving, not simply a little bit better than human driving. And that difference of perception may limit the environments that we are able to put chauffeur cars into uh, that are publicly acceptable. And so our idea here, and this is a new thing we're talking about, is to use two different software code bases, one of them for chauffeur, the other one's for Guardian, and each one is competent but was developed separately. We have separate sensors on both of the systems. And that redundancy in both hardware and software, we believe can help achieve the safety that is required to allow the public to accept chauffeur systems as being as safe as they need to be. So our conclusion to the question that was the title of this talk, what should the heart of an autonomous car be? Our conclusion is that the heart should be guardian. And that that guardian heart can guard a human being or it can guard an AI system, a chauffeur system. And as long as those software and hardware systems are separate and developed separately, the amount of reliability that could be achieved by using both of them at the same time might be substantially better than using just one. And that might be the key to what we need in this field to be safe enough. Thank you very much.